All the Torah that a person learns for the sake of guarding and for the sake of doing, and I'll use these words to make a brief review of what we discussed last time, that what does guarding and doing mean in this particular case, that when we learn Torah, particularly halacha, particularly in-depth halacha, not just what's the rule, but what's the reason for the rule, and what do the four guys say are all the reason for the rule, and how do we make a, a reason out of those four reasons. We get really good at learning schus on other yid, and saying, here's, this guy's a great guy, and let me give you 15 reasons why. <laughs> and let me give you sources for those 15 reasons. If I just say he's a good guy, the Yitzhahara might say, yeah, but... But if, but if I make an argument like that, the Yitzhah doesn't have much to say. And so that's a nice thing to do, but it also empowers our tefillah that we discussed that there are two levels of tefillah. There's a point at which our tefillahs automatically benefit everybody in the world, and there's a point that we're still working to that level, and it's only benefiting us. But the more that we can learn halacha with the intention of learning merit on others, we're connecting them to our personal prayers, and then any benefit we experience, they experience this too, to the degree to which we can learn merit in an intelligent way upon them. And then Rabbi Nachman continues, the call And all of the letters of the Torah, that's how I'm reading this here, to mean letters of the Torah, are parts of these souls. So we usually think of the Torah in concepts. Maybe we think in paragraphs, sort of, uh, which is made of many sentences, which is made of many words. And, and letters is even a little bit beyond the scope of most of our intelligence unless we start to delve into the Kabbalah. And even then, to break down a single word's meaning according to the meaning of the letters is a very, very deep, involved process. And every letter... Allah has come to comma, every word, every idea. How much more so, the bigger these get, these represent clusters of nishamas. So we discussed last time, it's very important in our learning to be wary not to disparage any ideas that we come across in the Torah. Because then, by doing so, we're disparaging the same, the very same yidin that we're hoping to learn schus on and therefore to benefit with our prayers. That's what we talked about last time. Now, they are encloaked in our prayer, and I think they come to include both the souls of the, those that we hope to help, and also the letters and all the ideas that are made up of those letters that we learn. These things are enclosed in our prayer. Now, to introduce today's class, we're going to ask a question on this idea that they're enclosed in the prayer, which is, if learning merit on people is such a great thing to do, which is pretty to do, what do I need to pray for? Seemingly, the learning merit directly benefits the person, and the prayer seems like an accessory to that at this point in the lesson. Now, maybe you could say that the prayer amplifies the effectiveness of my doing so. It's sort of like if I'm a cyclist, if I do some deadlift to make my legs stronger, it'll make me bike faster. Okay, that may be so, but if I just practice biking a lot, I just learn a whole lot of halacha, do I need the segula? I need sort of the, the, the side, the, the, the track work also, that it, or can I just focus on the learning the halacha to learn merit on other people and I become a lawyer? So wait, where does the prayer fit into this? So Rabbi Nachman is going to explain what it means that these souls are within the tefillah. Where in the tefillah exactly? If I tell you I'm, I'm in the mall, which store are you by? I need more specific information than that. So Rabbi Nachman is forthcoming with this information. They receive invigoration, these souls, they are renewed to their pure state. A soul is never actually tarnished at its essence. However, its garments, it can become superficially tarnished by whatever situations a person finds himself in life, whatever those may be, uh, but of course the soul itself at its essence is still pure. Uh, this is written about in many Hasidic books, and, and also in Kabbalah, it may even originally be a drasha from the Zoyahar about the, the soiled garments of Yechezkel when he met the Malach and he was told to change his clothes. And then it's represented that this is, that when our sins are atoned for and we've made tshuva, we're in an elevated spiritual state. And so we're elevating everybody's spiritual state. 
by by this work that we do in the prayer. That is they are nischadish, they are renewed at the soul level. And where are they renewed? In this level of ebor, as though the tefillah is a womb, and they are like uh, they are like infants in the womb, in in this pure pristine state. So what happens in this womb that has this effect of somehow connecting my, I'm learning halacha and, and I'm praying for these people and somehow this womb brings these things together. Rabbi Nachman explains by bringing a verse from Tehillim, you, you mentioned the night came in Tehillim, Hashemayim is Safarun Kavoy Kel, that the heavens, they discuss, they, they tell over the glory of God. So that's what happens in this womb. First of all, let's go for Gashi a little bit here. See that we're talking about a womb, which is this primordial place, very much sort of a back in time place. Okay, it was nice in the womb, but it's great I can talk now and walk around and things like that. So the womb seems a little bit like backtracking. I get it could have a cleansing benefit. It's like a metaphorical womb, but a real womb that seems like backtracking. And then he comes and says that that's called Shemayim, that's called heaven. And that's com- sort of completely the opposite. It seems like an extremely advanced, give me 150 years to pray at length every day and learn all day, and maybe I can discover this place called heaven where the angels are talking about the glory of God, which is something that's basically incomprehensible to, to regular folk like me. And they're talking about misoprim. They're talking about the regular thing to talk about. It's all day they're talking about. It. The whole thing. The whole everything they write, everything they say. So that's an extremely advanced thing. So what is this place in our prayer where it's completely advanced and completely primordial at the same time? What benefit does that have? So now Rabbi Nachman is going to define what he means by heaven a little bit more, and and this we're going to delve into. So heaven refers to the Torah. Okay, so we're constructing this womb from the Torah that we learn in order to learn merit on these people that's simple enough to put together. Then he tells us something that I don't know why we need to know this yet. That it's made of fire and water. It's a famous drasha. And we're going to bring a few sources for this drasha. That the word Shemayim that refers to heaven is a, a, a mashing together of the words A Shemayim. Shemayim. You can hear it. So it means it. So... Okay, so now I know that there's these two elements there, but what does that tell me about the benefit of this place, the nature of this place? So let's look a little bit into the sources where we see that Shemayim is called a Shemayim. And maybe we'll understand more. It's a, it's a general principle in the Kutu Mayuran that we can read the text at face value and get something out of it. And, and Rabbi Nachman knows all the terror that came before him and probably the terror that came after him too. However, that would work. I don't know how his mind works. But he, in, if you find something in Torah, in classical Torah, or Torah that came after the Kutu Mayuran, that seems to inform your reading of the Kutu Mayuran, in the way you name Bay, I now have more information in these couple of words I can call to mind. But I mean, not even intended that. He knew you were going to read that Torah one day, and he knew you were going to bring it, now you have a nice place to put it in the Kutu Mayuran here. He, he organizes vast amounts of Torah into these brief, relatively brief teachings. Okay, so we have in the Zoyar. He writes it the Bechesav, Mesitid the Chesed. He writes it the Baalpe, Mesitid the Kvua. That the Torah, the written Torah, the scriptures, but all religion, is from the side of Chesed. And he writes it the Baalpe, the Torah of Baalpe, the Mishnah, and Gemara, and Poiski, and Shalas, and Shuvis, and the rabbi's arguing stuff. Let's call it that for now. And there's a reason I'm calling it that. I'm certainly not saying that to be derogatory. I'm using it to call to mind a certain way of thinking that we'll discuss in this. The rabbi's arguing stuff. That's stuff from the Sadiq Kabura. And so he continues. And they come together in a certain place. And these great Shemayim. And this place they come together because it is the coming together of these two pla- things is called Shemayim. It's called heaven. When we can bring together in the perfect way the, the good old religion, just, just the plain verses, the word of God himself, and the 
rabbinic arguments that go on for millennium and are still going. Uh, then we make heaven. I make a space called Shemayim. And then the Zohar explains the connection here. Kalil a Shemayim, such as fire and water. Eish the Gevura, Mayim the Chasid. So to reestablish this connection with Eish of Gevura, this, this goes with the rabbis arguing stuff. Mayim the Chasid, this goes with the good old religion, just the simple, straightforward word of God. Okay. So, before we look at another source, let's look back at Lukutim Iran and see what we're holding with our understanding. So now, when Rabbi Nachman tells us that the Torah is, is heaven, basically, is, is also this womb of rejuvenating souls of all that we hope to benefit, all those whom we hope to benefit, he tells us that this comprises Torah Shabbat Pev and Torah Shabbat Asaf. The, the straightforward word, good word, and the rabbinic arguments, which comprises these two things. But we basically already knew that. So... We, we, we learn from the Zohar that the, the fire and water represent these two sides of the Torah. So that's a little bit of a chiddush in the understanding. But as far as our understanding of the lesson altogether, it doesn't seem, what, what have we added so far? So we need to look at another source. And the other source is structured a little bit differently. Here, Kiddush Nenu Bechagiga Yedbei Samad Aleph in the Gemara, Masech is Chagiga. My Shemayim, what is this thing called Shemayim? Because there's water there. Okay, so he makes a different drush. He's saying it's only water. It's only the good word. The straightforward, these are the verses. And then, but must need Satana, Eishimayim. Well, we have a deceptive. It says, it's an Eish and it's Mayim. It's, it's not just the straightforward verse, it's also the rabbinic arguing stuff. Learned that Hashem brought these two things together. They, they apparently needed to be brought together. Apparently, they were separate. And at some point, they were brought together and, and made this play, thing called Shemai. Now, there's an interesting implication about the structure of this drasha that we have an Amoira. Um, that tells us that it's just water. So that's a strong Havamina. Havamina is like you might have thought. He's pointing out the side, at the very least, even if you're not, even if you don't say that Rabbi Yosef Bachanina actually says it's only Mayan and not Eish, he's at least pointing out this is a very real conclusion that people could come to. He's letting us know that this is out there. Somebody asked one time, why is the Gemara so complicated with all the back and forth? And a very classical answer to that is so you have what to say to the heretic. Um, and so there were things that are brought to Gemara. There's a, a video on YouTube of a guy going around say, asking a Haredi, hey, it says this in your Talmud. Hey, it says that in your Talmud. And a lot of them kind of laugh him off and they don't really take it seriously. And that's because these words, Hava Amina. There's other phrases, but I'll just use this in this example. Hava Amina means you would have thought. You could read a whole thing, but if you didn't read, you would have thought, you'd think, oh, the Gemara is actually saying that. No, Hava Amina means Davka. It's not saying that. Here's a misconception. We're worried that you're going to come to. So, so this is a very real thing to be aware of when you're learning the Gemara is that it's not always telling you things that it's saying are the truth, right? So we don't know, we don't have the full context before us now, and it's not a Gemara shear that we're going to go in depth on this mime of Rabbi Yoisi Bachanina, but here he's pointing out to us that there's this conception once you come into that it is only mine. Now let's look back at the text of Lukut and Eglon. I mean, Ahmed says, Zehu, this location in our prayers where the souls go, that they are rejuvenated by our learning of Ruachah. Hashemayim is happening with Boyd Kale. This is the heaven where they, they talk about, it already we're sort of implying this back and forth, this rabbinic argument, Kvoid Kale, the glory of God, the, the, the good word. They talk about it, they discuss it. Okay, fine. Hainu HaTorah, meaning the Torah, Shehu Eish Umayim. That is Eish Umayim, lest you think it's only Mayim. Okay, so now, let's, let's zoom out a little bit and look at the full context of the teaching. So now we see there's this new emphasis here on specifically Torah Shabbat Al Peh, the rabbinic arguing stuff, which is really the hard work. It, it's just 
more difficult to learn that stuff than it is to learn straightforward scriptures, even with commentaries, even with more Madrasha commentaries that expound more. And especially when it gets into legal things, we have to make legal decisions, the laws of monetary disputes, the laws of witnesses, laws of what constitutes a kosher marriage in sticky situations. Very, very complicated discussion. They have to be, so we come to fair conclusions. Very difficult. Um, and Rabbi Nachman is emphasizing this to us. But, seemingly, what's our job here? We have to learn out Schus an Yidin in a very intelligent way that the Yitzhahara can't just come and shut down. So we kind of already knew that we needed Teresha Al pay for that. In the Humash, you can't even figure out how, what the fill in are. What are Toitafoys? Rashi said it's an African word. Like, how do you know what to fill in is? You know, it says in the uncle it says it. But already, we're talking about commentaries here. So if I were to try to learn merit on someone just from straight scripture, it would be tremendously difficult to make a well-formed, difficult to shut down argument, right? Because somebody could all say, well, I have another scripture that says that he's going to burn if he does this and that. And I saw him doing it. Okay, hold on. But here's 15 reasons, right? So we already knew that we need the ish side of it here. So there's a third way to look at this. The misconception that Rabbi Nachman is warning us about here is to think that it is only mine. And and Chas uh, V'Shalom is not like with Rabbi Yosef Bar Fenina here. The way I'm reading him is that he's saying it's a Hava Amina. He's emphasizing that, you know, oh, you might think it's Mayim, so that then the Gemara is going to bring the Tosef to tell you, no, it's Asian Mayim. Yeah, for sure it's Mayim. He's saying true. For sure there's Mayim there. He's not saying it's not Ish. That's not what the Mayim says. He says there's Mayim there. Oh, good. You caught it. Also, there's Ish. Yeah. So, the misconception we might fall into is that there's that it's only... It, it, there's a very natural temptation to fall into... Let's just go with the good word. This, uh, this rabbinic arguing stuff. This is what does anybody make it? How does anybody understand what this stuff means? I don't know. Sometimes I think they just argue for the sake of arguing. How many times have you heard that? <clears throat> How many times have you said that? I'm not saying anybody here. <laughs> and I, uh, okay. And so, um, why might why why is this that there is this natural pull to fall away from because it? it's interesting it's not and, and it's not that it's it's not that anybody here is lazy anybody who, who's had a job probably and had some moderate amount of success or more has probably worked tremendously hard it's a passion it's worked tremendously hard it's not laziness that's not why there's a temptation to fall back to the mind thing. so good the law case laws of washing hands. Uh, specifically, the, the detail of washing the hands for davening. Reb Nassim Zal talks about the, uh, the nature of Mayim. And so Mayim was one of the very first things that was created. This is the God's spirit floating on the water. Where did the water come from? He didn't make light yet, seemingly. There's a Zohar that says he just brought the light out. But the water is mentioned for light. Before that, it was like Toyu and Boyu and Hoyshek. It was complete just chaos. I have no idea what's going on. Mayim was the first semi-identifiable thing. Yeah. So let's call that like the insight, basically. As far as we're practically concerned, the, the, the Kutte Mayim 22, he says, whatever the level above you is, that's called Ainso for you. Right. So something like Toyu and Boyu, I can't even begin to imagine what that substance is. There's a, I, 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 there's like a, I, th I think boy who is, uh, there's this rock that's the source of all money and it makes everybody mad and the madness that comes out of it is called boy who, I, I think it's a Zoyar that says that. And I, can't, I can't even imagine that, but I can't imagine Maya. I don't know what's going on in the ocean. I want to support a little bit more this idea of Maya being Ein Sof for the purpose of discussion so that people don't start thinking funny things about me. In Halakha, there are Rahman al Islam laws of determining if someone has drowned. And there are reasons that we would need to determine this information. It's not a halakha shir, but I'll just say there are reasons. And there's a distinction made with Mayim Shiesh Basoif and Mayim Shayla Basoif. If there is a water, like a lake, you can see the end of it. So if someone, Chas Shalim, falls into this water and we don't see them come up, and we could have seen any of the places where they came up, probably not coming back up. It's been an amount of time that it would take for human not to come back up. If it's the ocean, 
and we cannot see the end of it, we cannot assume anything in particular happened to this person out at sea because we don't know. There could be a little island, there could be a little thing floating they popped up onto, it. somebody came in a boat, we just couldn't see it. So there is this element of Ein Sof with water. Now, Ein Sof is something that we can say, oh, nobody understands what's going on with that. And, and this is a very common way of making um, heresy out of scriptures, is that we can say, all oh, your rabbinic argument stuff, and not, they, they don't, nobody knows what that stuff means. And then once they shut down, the, the guys, they, they, they shut down someone's rabbinic argument thing, and, and the guy is feeling negged, then, then they make their own Peshat up, right? And then they tell them they're heretical Peshat. It's a very common setup for heresy. And, uh, and I'm basically summarizing for you this Likud Yabach. This is not really my ideas. Uh, so, water being something so early in creation is something that must be elevated, because otherwise it is a source for heresy. It, it, it comes out of water. There's other things that come out of water. Uh, it's related with desires, be they good or not good, but heresy in this case is, is our concern, um, because that is the whole, like, oh, they're just arguing for the sake of arguing. This is a, a subtly so, and I'm not accusing anyone who said that of anything, but this is a leaning heretical thought. Okay. So, and, and we'll say a little bit more why with regard to this liquid in modern moment. But, so what do we do with water to elevate it? Is we wash our hands before we pray. So we wash our hands, and then we pray. Right, we do the thing with the water, we make a relationship with the water, and then we go straight to Amun uh, the, the word in the Siddur, there's a lot of stuff in the Siddur that does not come from the Chumash. It does not come from Tanakh. There's stuff that comes from Tanakh. But there, there's, I mean, look at Long Tachnin. There's Pesukim in there, but there's a lot of, like, there's Putim, and there's all sorts of stuff. The structure of it, that's not from Tanakh. It's from the Gemara. And it's from, it's from Poiskim. Different Nusach, Ashkenaz, Nusach, Spar. You're not going to figure out that from Tanakh. So, we elevate the water specifically. Now, here's the. Now, besides for being heretical, I, I was only saying that to give you the idea of Lakut de but not to tie it into our concept, because this is not really a theory about heresy. It's really a theory about how we make our prayers help other Jews at all levels of our prayers, even if we haven't reached the highest level yet. We want to learn merit. On them. If we disparage an idea in the Torah, this is counterproductive with regard to learning merit on them. If we say, if whenever we feel that temptation that I just want to go back to the plain scriptures without all this rabbinic arguing, mumbo jumbo, automatically we're just, that is disparaging all the rabbinic stuff. Mm. That thought is doing it. If, if I'm reading something I'm like, ah, this Rashi's long, this Ramban's long, I think I'll skip it. Now, um, look, somebody can, get, somebody can drown in the Sea of Torah. Uh, to, when I was in the Shiva, there's a, a very common learning Seder to learn the days of Leah. You know, the, every partial split of seven Leahs, the split for seven days a week, and learn that. Usually with Rashi, maybe Ramban, add a little bit something. Anyway, I had this idea in Yeshiva. I was going to go work really hard, and I, uh, I would read everything in the Mikus in Gadol. I saw the Orachayim, everything in there, Kliyaka, everything in there. I had no idea. My translations codes were not good. At that point, I could read the words that I think I was saying them basically right. But I'm not sure. And on the one hand, it was like a good, like, you know, he's working hard. He, he's Kabbalah Sel Shemayim there. But on the other hand, I was sort of drowning in the Sea of Tzirah. I didn't remember anything. I didn't understand it in the first place, right? So there is a legitimate reason to say, oh, look, this is beyond me for now. That's okay. I'm definitely not bashing anything since then. But we should want to learn it. I don't currently learn the Bach generally speaking, in, when I learn Tor, Beis Yosef, and then I go to Shulchan Aruch. The Bach is this whole other thing. Sometimes I'll reference the Bach, but I don't learn it in the Seder. But I'd love to. I'm not saying I don't learn the Bach and it's not worthy of learning. It's, like, it's just getting too like whimsy this way, that way. No, it's just because I'm not holding it yet. So, so but any time that we say, this comment is too long, it's too windy, ah, that's what I'd be not concerned about. And then he says, Ha'inu v'chinus and Hishamwais, this appreciation of the real complexity of Torah and the back and forth, this is what soul is. I mean, that's it. Ha'inu v'chinus and Hishamwais. 
This is what we're trying to benefit here. The soul is simple and tremendously complex. Oh, I got to see the end.